as a collective, under your leadership, would move swiftly to overcome this initial mishap and partner with the executive to advance the progress and development of our country. For my part, I assure you and the House of my commitment to work with you to realize the aspirations of the Ghanaian people. Accept, Mr. Speaker, the assurances of my highest esteem. Yours sincerely, Nana Adodankwa Akufuadu. This is to the right honorable speaker, Office of Parliament, Parliament House, Accra, and copied the Vice President, Jubilee House, and the Chief of Staff, Jubilee House, Accra. Honourable members, to make a formal communication to the House and through you, as you all know, this is the first event. Parliament of the Fourth Republic of Ghana. Honorable members, I would like first and foremost to express my gratitude once again to all of you for your support in electing me as the Speaker of the A Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. In accordance with Article 95, clauses 1 and 3 of the Constitution and Orders 8 and 9 of the Standing Orders of the Parliament of Ghana. As I pledge to you and the nation on the occasion of my election as Speaker, I am fully committed to serving this House and this country faithfully and conscientiously as the Speaker for members of Parliament and indeed all Ghanaians. Let me give a special welcome to the fresh hands in the house. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate each and every one of you once again on being elected or re-elected as a member of the 8th Parliament of the Fourth Republic. I am particularly delighted to welcome and reliably inform the 123 fresh hands who are assuming your seats as members of this house for the first time. You have now earned the privilege to be addressed in this chamber as honorable. And please, honorable you must be. Whatever may have been your inspiration for choosing to embark on this path, I would like you to know that the position you now occupy as a member of parliament is a position of leadership, of honor, of privilege, of trust, and above all, of service. Your constituents have reposed in you, as in the rest of your colleagues, an enormous amount of confidence and trust in electing you to represent them 
and their interest in this house of the people of Ghana. You have a reciprocal responsibility and obligation to serve them and the nation with honor and integrity. Remember at all times that you lead your people best by serving them with respect, with humility, and with diligence. My office, together with the Office of the Clerk of Parliament and the Parliamentary Service as a whole, stands ready to assist you with a range of services and resources, including training necessary to make your transition into your new role as smooth as possible. I'm also confident that you will find among your returning colleagues many who are able and willing to help you navigate and learn the ropes here as quickly as you can so that you can contribute effectively to the business of the house and make an impact within the shortest possible time. Ultimately, responsibility for having a successful career in this house rests with you. Remember that this house is a house of rules and procedures. Thus, knowledge, time, mastery, and procedures in the business and proceedings of the house will be indispensable to your success as a member, as well as make my job as speaker all the more effective. May your career in this house be as long as product and as productive as mine has been. A word to those of you who are going to become ministers. Honorable members, by the dictates of the Constitution of the Fourth Republic, some of you will in due course be nominated and with the approval of this House, appointed by the President to positions in his administration as ministers and deputy ministers of state. During my 20-year career as a member of parliament, I had the opportunity to serve as a minister of state in different capacities. This so-called, quote, hybrid, unquote, feature of our constitutional system means, in effect, that a certain number of you will, at a given time, be under a duty to serve three masters, constituency, parliament, and the president. Honorable members, you are all well aware of the biblical injunction to not serve two masters lest you become, quote, devoted to one and despise the other, unquote. I know the pastors among you can give you where to find this statement. But for some of my colleagues who have never looked at the, the Holy Book, you can get it in Matthew 6, 24. In your situation, it is even worse. You are enjoined to serve not two masters, but what? Three masters. Needless to say, our experience has shown that in the case of members who double as ministers, the master that is often sacrificed and left holding the shorter end of the stick is parliament. Members who are appointed to ministerial office generally prioritize their executive branch rules over their parliamentary rules. Scholars and students of governance have observed and noted the myriad ways in which this arrangement has served to unbalance the relationship between the executive and parliament and affected adversely 
the ability of parliament and of members of parliament to carry out faithfully their representative financial oversight, deliberative, and legislative roles. Until we reform this constitutional arrangement to improve the country's governance, however, I believe all parties, all players implicated in this arrangement, namely the president, parliament itself, and those members appoint us as ministers have each a responsibility to take steps to minimize the negative impact of this arrangement on the business mandate and performance of the House. As a former member of this House, with a parliamentary career as long and as old as this Fourth Republic, one thing I do know for sure is that drawing a large number of ministers and deputy ministers of state from the membership of parliament is unhelpful to the business of parliament and also weakens parliament's ability to perform its proper role in the promotion of good governance. Be that as it may, members appointed to serve as ministers or deputy ministers must understand that you are members of parliament first and foremost. In fact, in most or nearly all cases, you will have earned your appointment as Minister of State on account of your position or standing as a member of parliament. It behoves on such members, therefore, to continue to take your parliamentary roles and responsibilities Seriously. Indeed, the anecdotal evidence suggests that among members who double as ministers, those who strive to balance their responsibilities to both branches of government as, as difficult as they may, tend to have more successful and longer careers on both sides. I now proceed to say a word of the expectation of the people on the eighth parliament of the fourth republic. Honorable members, in the general elections of December 7, 2020, out of which this parliament has emerged, the people of Ghana sent a loud and clear message to the political class when they voted to deny both the new patriotic party, MPP for short, and the National Democratic Congress, NDC, single party control of the legislative branch. The score of 137 for MPP and 137 for NDC with one independent. The decision of no majority party and no minority party in parliament is a call for us to chart a new path. to embark on new ways of transacting parliamentary business. Who should know or ought to know is the business of the people. I urge the leadership of both sides of the House to put their heads together to smoothen out any bottlenecks or challenges that may impede the contact of business in the House. I am ever ready to assist in this direction. The message which these results convey, I believe, may be summed up in the common expression, enough is enough. Or to put it differently, no more business as usual. 
And I repeat, no more business as usual. I believe that the people of Ghana, in voting as they did in the last elections, have signaled their frustration with and their disapproval of, quote, party first, party first mindset and the associated unbridled partisanship and partisan polarization that have taken root in our politics and are giving our option of parliamentary democracy a bad name. I would like to believe also that the first indication that this message may have begun to sing is the very fact of my elect as Speaker of Parliament. Despite not being the nominee or preference of those members whose party's rabbi has been declared by the chair of the Electoral Commission as president-elect. I am sincerely grateful for the bipartisan approval of my speakership of this parliament by you. And for now, all I can say is God richly bless you all. Honorable members, the people of Ghana would like us to prioritize the needs and concerns of the country and of all Ghanaians above our own private or parochial interests or the narrow interests of one or the other political party. The people of Ghana are growing tired of politics as usual, of seeing their elected and appointed officials treat their political parties and political party identities as if those were bigger and more important than our common citizenship, and as if those artificial identities were ends in themselves as opposed to a means to the ultimate end, namely, the collective progress and development of the country. The people of Ghana are demanding sound and effective solutions to their everyday problems, needs, frustrations, anxieties, and fears. The youth in particular wants to be inspired, motivated, and giving hope for a better future of unlimited opportunities. They want this country to grow and to prosper, to realize and live up to its full potential, to use its bountiful resources to deliver opportunity and generate prosperity and good for its people. And they are entitled to ask for that. In case we are at a loss as to what this means for the substance of the work we must do here in this house, you and I would do well to refer to the directive principles of state policy contained in Chapter 6 of the Constitution. The directive principles of state policy stands as a constant reminder to us of what duty Parliament and members owe individually and collectively to our dear country and its people. In swearing fidelity to the Constitution, as we did on the occasion of our respective assumptions of office, what we undertook to do at a minimum is to use the public power, the privilege, and the associated opportunities and resources entrusted to us in ways and for purposes that will bring us closer as a nation to realizing the ambitions, goals, principles, and policies we have set ourselves in Chapter 6 of the Constitution. I entreat all of you, honorable members of this August body, to make the directive principles of state policy 
your primary guide to action in the discharge of the responsibilities and rules of your office. Together with the provisions of Chapter 5 of the Constitution, including notably the provisions on economic rights, educational rights, cultural rights, women's rights, children's rights, rights of disabled persons, and rights of the sick, contained in Articles 24 through to 30 of the Constitution. The directive principles of state policy are, in essence, our own domestic version of the Sustainable Development Goals, whose realization we have committed ourselves internationally. Those ambitions, goals, principles, and policies are the barometer by which we must measure our service and performance in this house. In addressing the issue of what the people of Ghana expect of this parliament, I would be remiss if I did not express my deepest regret, both as a former member of this parliament and a citizen of this great nation, at the rather unruly behavior and commotion that took place on the floor of this house last week, including the presence of armed soldiers on the floor and the breaches of the sanctity of the vote that would otherwise attract severe punishment in connection with the election of the Speaker of the A Parliament. It was, to put it mildly, despicable conduct on becoming of people of honor. What makes it more, what makes it worse is the total absence of justification or reasonable excuse. As Speaker, I would like to believe that the spectacle of that historic day would not be repeated. Certainly, not on my watch. I take a strong, I take a strong exception to such conduct and behavior, and I urge leadership to take a serious view of it and take the necessary measures to restore the lost dignity of this August House. This is at variance with the message that the good people of Ghana gave us in the 2020 election. Now to our core mandate and mission as an arm of government. Honorable members, the outcome of the recent general election employ us to rededicate ourselves to the true and core mandate and mission of Parliament. There appears to be some amount of confusion and misunderstanding as to what the appropriate role of Parliament is in our constitutional system. Much of this is as a result of the two-party structure and composition of the House within the context of our winner-take-all politics. Because of this, whenever Parliament is dominated by the same party that holds the presidency and forms the government, the common perception and expectation is that Parliament will automatically support the government's agenda without regard to its merits. In short, we have come to assume that government is entitled to have its way in Parliament. And because of this, there have been the Ghanaian public's perception of how Parliament has conducted itself under various administrations in the Fourth Republic. This current development of a house in which neither party has a secure or dominating majority in other words, no majority party and no minority party and of a speaker who is not beholden to or endorsed by the president is causing many of our citizens both in and out of government, including in this house, a great deal of consternation. To them, if government is not guaranteed its way in the parliament, 
then such a parliament can only be obstructionist. Honorable members, this concern is needless, as it is based on an incorrect view of what this parliament's role is, and indeed, what its role has been in the House in the Fourth Republic. Regardless of which party has the upper hand in the House, it will be wrong to see Parliament's role as either obstructing or rubber stamping government's agenda. Parliament cannot discharge any of its core mandates, deliberative, legislative, financial control, oversight, and representational by being either obstructionist or a rubber stamp. As the foremost accountability institution in our constitutional system, Parliament's role is to check and balance the executive, not to obstruct or rubber stamp the executive's agenda. Parliament does its job as it must when it questions, investigates, reviews, and scrutinizes the executive, its bills, its nominations, and its proposed agreements, and then proceed to approve, to amend, or to reject them, as the case may be. As one who comes to the speakership with the longest record of bravery service as a member of this House, I can recount instances of Parliament playing precisely this role and thereby helping to improve the quality of our nation's governance. Even in the first Parliament, when the new patriotic party boycotted the 1992 parliamentary elections and left the House with no real opposition party, bills proposed by the executive were not accorded routine rubber stamp treatment. They were subjected to close review, scrutiny, and modification where necessary. A case in point is a bill that later became the law criminalizing causing financial loss to the state. When it was introduced in the first parliament, the bill as drafted had no mens rea. A mens rea requirement was absent. It would have made causing financial loss to the state a strict liability offense. I recall, and the hazard record will show, that the amendment to add the word willfully to the law came from the floor of the House. With its almost total control of the House, the dominant party at that time could have simply rubber stamped the bill, but it did not. I also recall that Parliament has, on one occasion in the past, declined to approve certain nominations of the President. A case in point was the refusal of the House to consider and to approve the nomination of a Court of Appeal judge to be appointed as Justice of the Supreme Court. As long as it is done in good faith and with transparent justification, such cases cannot be called rubber stamping or obstructions. As Speaker, I will not yield to pressure from any quarter to allow this August House to be turned into a rubber stamp or an obstructor. With this, I move to the impartiality of the speaker. Let me say a few words about the office of speaker as envisioned under our constitution. While past practice might lead some to think otherwise, the truth of the matter is that the speaker is not a partisan political office. Regardless of which party nominated or voted to elect him or her, 
and regardless of his or her previous political background, the Speaker of Parliament of Ghana occupies a nonpartisan, impartial office. There is no and nothing known as MPP Speaker or NDC Speaker. There This is of interest to you. I repeat, there is no MPP speaker or NDC speaker. There is only a speaker of the parliament of Ghana and all Ghanaians. Unlike my counterpart in the American House of Representatives, the Ghanaian Speaker is not a member of the House. The Ghanaian Speaker presides over but does not participate in proceedings of the House. And he or she has no vote. And he or she has no vote not even a casting vote in matters before the House. In fact, the speakership in Ghana is designed to be even more impartial and more apolitical than the Speaker of the House of Commons in Westminster. It is indeed to ensure that the Speaker remains impartial in presiding over the affairs of this House and Parliament that his election is done by secret vote. Honorable yeah. members, the independence and impartiality of the speaker is particularly evident from one line in the speaker's oath. That line is not found in the presidential oath, the oath of vice president, the oath for ministers of state and cabinet, or the oath of a member of parliament. That line reads, and I quote, and I will do right to all manner of persons in accordance with the constitution and the laws and convention of parliament without fear or favor, affection or ill will, unquote. That last phrase, quote, without fear or favor, affection or ill will, defines the office of speaker as an impartial, nonpartisan office. I assure you, I don't take this oath lightly at all. My destiny, my destiny, my destiny on this earth and the earth after is in my own hands. Honorable yeah. members, the only other oaths in the second scheduled to the Constitution of the Fourth Republic in which you find this same language are the judicial oath and the oath of the Auditor General. This is because, like the Speaker, these offices too are meant to be non-partisan, impartial, and independent. Honorable members, much has been made of the fact that I come to this position from a long career as a politician and member of the National Democratic Congress. One, one 
of the two parties represented in this house. As far as I'm concerned, that fact is of no consequence to my new role as speaker. In fact, it is not a novelty in this house. I myself have worked harmoniously with speakers of diverse political backgrounds, including on one occasion supporting the nomination for re-election as speaker of the Fourth Republic, a well-known figure of the new patriotic party. In fact, I treated him like my father outside the business of the house. But more importantly, as I've made clear, the office now, the office I now occupy is an impartial, independent, and apolitical office, akin to that, in that regard, to the position of a justice or chief justice. Yes, as a person with a known party affiliation like myself could be appointed to a Supreme Court, so it is with the speakership. What matters above all is that once appointed as a chief justice or justice, or elected as a speaker, that person, regardless of the political past, must conduct himself or herself in accordance with the requirements and ethics of his or her new office, and as expressed in the oath of that office without fear or favor, affection or ill will. Honorable members, I intend to leave by the oath at swore at the occasion of my election to this office to respect and obey, to respect and abide by the will of the House. I am fully committed to being fair and impartial, but I'm also fully committed to being fair and resolute. Members must also, in reciprocity, respect and abide by my rulings and instructions. When in disagreement, the standing orders of the House has the answer for you. I will apply the authority of the House as symbolized by the base to protect and defend your prerogatives, privileges, and immunities of members of parliament and staff as provided under the laws of the country. Let me, at this juncture, acknowledge the many contributions made by my predecessors in whose shoes I work today. The Right Honorable Justice Daniel Francis Anna laid a solid foundation to anchor the growth and development of parliamentary law, practice, and procedure in the Fourth Republican Parliament. I acknowledge with great appreciation and respect the contributions of Right Honorable Peter Lagetti, Right Honorable Ebenezer Sechi Hughes, Right Honorable Justice Joyce Adlin Bamford Adu. Right Honorable Edward Obla Do Ajahu and Right Honorable Professor Aaron Mai Okwe. I have worked closely with all these speakers as a leader and a member of the Parliamentary Service Board. And I can attest to the tireless efforts each and every one of them made to consolidate, strengthen the institution of parliament and to build the capacity of members and staff of parliament. I pledge to build on these achievements and to widen and deepen the frontiers of parliamentary governance even further. 
particularly so that we'll be opening our doors to the public, civil society, the media, and all who are interested in the health of the democracy in this country. Honorable members, some critical laws could not be passed by the previous parliament, and these have gone into abeyance with the dissolution of the seventh parliament of the Fourth Republic. Draft legislations such as the Affirmative Action Bill, Sparta Rights Bill, Standing Orders of the House, which has been pending before the House since 2002. The Budget Bill, International Business and Agreement Bill, called for urgent action. I call on the responsible sponsoring government agencies or institutions to resubmit this bill to the House early for consideration. In particular, I call on Parliament to expeditiously deal with the review of the standing orders of the House. My vision, with open heart, is a vision of bipartisan, inclusive, participatory, responsive, efficient, and effective parliament. The eighth parliament will have to work to earn the respect of the people of Ghana and to restore the image and dignity of the institution. There is nothing more noble and satisfied than to render services to your people. I would like to end by echoing the words of President Akufuadu when he delivered his message on the state of the nation on the dissolution of the seven parliament. I want to quote, the good people of Ghana have spoken and giving Parliament almost equal strength on both sides of the House. We have no chance. I repeat, the good people of Ghana have spoken and given Parliament almost equal strength on both sides of the house. We have no choice but to work with the consequences of the desires of the people. The house would have to be more accommodating of each other's views and probably devise new ways of conducting its affairs." Unquote. I fully subscribe to that view. No more, no less. Cooperation, dialogue, accommodation, and consensus building must guide this parliament in the conduct of its business. We must work together for the betterment of Ghana and Ghanaians. That, I believe, is the demand of Ghanaians and the loud and clear message of the 2020 general elections. That is the message in the votes of 136 in favor of Right Honorable Aaron Michael Quay, as to 138 for Honorable Aaron Michael Vote for bear me to this high office of Speaker of the Parliament of Ghana. Honorable members, honorable members, the battle is always the Lord's. 
Glory be to the Most High. I thank all of you for your patience and attention. God bless you.